Welcome back to Pistress Concrete Structures. This is the fourth lecture in the module 9 on special topics. Today, we are continuing the two-way slabs and in today's lecture, we shall cover the checking for shear capacity. Then, we shall study the design of spandrel beams. After that, we shall move on to the anchorage devices and finally, we shall mention some additional aspects for the design of two-way slabs. Last time, I talked about the analysis and design for the flexural capacity and what we have learned that the flexural analysis is done by considering equivalent frames in each orthogonal direction. The equivalent frame is analyzed under the gravity and lateral loads and from that we calculate the moments at the critical sections and once we know the moments at the critical sections we distribute that in the column strip and the middle strip. Then by the value of moment per unit width we design for the pre stressing tendons. Next when we are looking for the shear capacity the checking for shear capacity of flat plates and flat slabs is of utmost importance. In absence of beams, the shear is resisted by the slab near the slab to column junction. We have to understand that when there are beams, then the shear demand on the slab is much less. But in absence of beams, the shear demand on the slab near the slab to column junction is quite high. And hence, the checking for shear capacity in two-way slabs is extremely important, especially if the two-way slabs is a flat plate and a flat slab. The shear capacity of a slab could be adequate to resist the shear from two actions. The first is the one-way shear, which is also called the beam shear. And the second is the two-way or the punching shear. That means for two-way slabs, we analyze for two types of shear. First is the one-way shear and the second is the two-way shear. The one-way shear is analogous to that generates in a beam due to flexure. This is checked in a two-way slab for each spanning direction separately. The critical section for checking the shear capacity is at a distance effective depth d from the face of the column across the entire width of the frame. The critical section is transverse to the spanning direction. For gravity loads, the shear demand in the critical section generates from the loads in the tributary area shown in the next figure. For lateral loads, the shear demand is calculated from the analysis of the equivalent frame. Thus, first, once we have determined the equivalent frame and we know the spanning direction, the one-way shear is checked for a section which is transverse to the spanning direction and at a distance of the effective depth from the face of the support. In this sketch, you can see that the critical section which is marked by the dashed line is at a distance d from the face of the column. Note that the spanning direction is running east-west 
whereas the critical section is running north south. The shear demand that comes in this critical section can be determined based on this tributary area which is shown shaded for gravity loads. But if there are lateral loads, then we get the shear in the critical section from the analysis of the equivalent frame. This shear is analogous to the shear that generates in a beam under flexure. In presence of a drop panel, true critical section needs to be checked. The first section is at a distance d1 from the face of the column where d1 is the effective depth of the drop panel. The second section is at a distance d2 from the face of the drop panel where d2 is the effective depth of the slab. Thus, if there is a variation of thickness of the slab due to the drop panel, and the first critical section is at a distance d1 from the face of the column or the column capital where d1 is the effective depth of the drop panel. The second critical section is at a distance d2 from the face of the drop panel where d2 is the effective depth of the slab. Thus, whenever there is a variation in the depth of the slab, we need to have multiple critical sections checked. The calculations can be for unit width of the slab, the shear demand due to gravity loads per unit width is given as follows, V u is equal to W u times 0 0.5 L n minus d, here L n is the clear span along the spanning direction. Thus, if we know the tributary area, the length of the tributary area is half the clear span minus the effective depth d and then the shear demand per unit width of the slab is given as w u which is the factored gravity load per unit area times the length of the tributary area. Now, this is the shear demand that we are calculating for the gravity loads. The shear capacity per unit width is given as follows, V u r is equal to V c, where V c is the shear capacity of uncracked concrete of unit width of the slab. The expression of V c is given in the module of analysis and design for shear and torsion. In slab design, conventionally we do not place shear reinforcement. The shear capacity is given only by the shear capacity of concrete and the shear capacity of concrete there are two expressions given in the code, one for uncracked sections and another for cracked sections. Usually near the support the uncracked section governs and once we know V c we equate that to V u r the resistance for shear. For adequate shear capacity, we need to have V u r greater than equal to V u. That means, the capacity should be greater than or equal to the demand. If this is not satisfied, it is preferred to increase the depth of the slab to avoid shear reinforcement along the width of the slab. Thus, if in absence of drop panels, if we have a shear demand which is exceeding the shear capacity, then we can provide a drop panel that means, we can thicken the part of the slab near the column and we can have V u r greater than or equal to V c. That means, without providing shear reinforcement, if we can increase the thickness of the slab, then we may have the shear capacity greater than the shear demand and this is preferred to avoid shear reinforcement in the slab. Next, we are moving on to two way shear. The two way shear is specific to two way slabs. If the capacity is inadequate, the slab may fail due to punching around the column. 
The punching occurs along a conical frustum whose base is geometrically similar and concentric to the column cross section. The punching shear failure is typical for two way slabs and in absence of beams. In this case, under the gravity loads or if there are moments to be transferred from the slab to the column, there can be cracking in the slab which appears like a conical frustum whose base is similar to the column cross section. Thus, in this figure you can this is the elevation where you see that there is a conical crack in the slab and the slab tends to drop down from the slab and column junction. The failure surface looks like a conical frustrum. Note that the failure section is geometrically similar to the column cross section. Two way shear is checked for the two spanning directions simultaneously. So, this is unlike one way shear where we checked the shear capacity individually in each of the spanning direction, but in two way shear we check the capacity for both the directions simultaneously. The critical section for checking the shear capacity is geometrically similar to the column cross section and is at a distance of d by 2 from the face of the column. Thus, based on the observed behavior under punching, we select a critical section which is all around the column and it is geometrically similar to the column cross section and it is at a distance of d by 2 from the face of the column or column capital. In our following expressions, we shall use these notations. C 1 is the dimension of the column in the one direction, C 2 is the dimension of the column in the other orthogonal direction, B 1 is the width of the critical section which is parallel to C 1 and B 2 is the dimension of the critical section which is parallel to C 2. Thus, the perimeter of the critical section is twice B 1 plus B 2. The depth of the critical section is equal to the average of the effective depth of the slab in the two directions. We may have different effective depths in the two spanning directions because the steel in the two directions will lie above each other. But for computational simplicity, we consider an average effective depth for both the two directions and that is the value of d we use to compute b 1 and b 2. The sketch below shows the isometric view of the critical section. Thus, for a rectangular column, we have a rectangular critical section with dimensions b 1, b 2 and depth is equal to the average effective depth which is d. The lengths of the sides of the critical section along and transverse to the spanning direction are denoted as b 1 and b 2 respectively. b 1 is equal to c 1 plus d because each side the section is at a distance of d by 2. Hence, b 1 is equal to c 1 plus d by 2 on the left plus d by 2 on the right and hence b 1 is equal to c 1 plus d. Similarly, b 2 is equal to c 2 plus d and here c 1 is the dimension of the column or column capital in the spanning direction and c 2 is the dimension of the column or column capital in the transverse direction. For a non rectangular column, the critical section consists of the slab edges as per figure 13 IS 456 2000. There can be columns other than rectangular columns and in such situations, 
the code IS456-2000 gives us guidelines how to select the critical section for non-rectangular columns. For edge and corner columns, the critical section consists of the slab edges as per figure 14 IS456-2000. That means, if a column is close to an edge and in that case, the critical section has the slab edge as one of its sides and how to select the critical section in such a situation is also given in IS 456-2000. We are not going into the details of the special cases, but we are focusing on the calculating the shear demand and the shear capacity for a critical section of an interior rectangular column. The demand in terms of shear stress is given as follows. Tau V is equal to V u divided by V 0 d plus M u V about 2 2 axis times B 1 by 2 divided by J about 2 2 axis plus M u V about 1 1 axis times B 2 divided by 2 divided by J about 1 1 axis. Let us try to understand this generic expression by the individual terms. Note that here we are calculating the shear demand in terms of the shear stress tau v. V u is the shear due to gravity loads from the tributary area. Now, what is the tributary area that we shall come later? That means, the first term V u divided by B 0 d comes from the gravity loads in the tributary area. M u v is a fraction of moment transferred about an axis. For flat plates and flat slabs, the moments from the slab is transferred to the column by the slab to column junction. And part of this moment is resisted by shear and that we are determining by a special expression we shall see later and we are denoting the part of the moment that is transferred by shear as m u v. Now, when the moment is acting about the axis 1 1, the corresponding notation of the moment which generates shear stress is m u v about 1 1. Similarly, when the moment acts about the axis 2 2, the corresponding moment generating shear stress is denoted as m u v 2 2. B 0 is the perimeter of the critical section, which is, is equal to twice B 1 plus B 2. This we had earlier seen that for a rectangular cross sectional column, we have a rectangular critical section and in that case B 0 is equal to twice B 1 plus B 2. J is the polar moment of inertia of the critical section about an axis. We shall see what is the expression of J, but again we have to calculate J about 2 axis, so about 1 1 and about 2 2 axis. The tributary area of the column is the area within the center line of the spans minus the area within the critical section. It is shown shaded in the sketch below. When we are calculating V u, we are considering this shaded area, which is the area bounded by the center line of the adjacent spans. From that, we are deducting the area which is within the critical section. Thus, this shaded area generates the shear force V u. The second and third terms are due to transfer of moments from slab to the column. The moment about an axis is due to the unbalanced gravity loads for the two sides of the column or due to lateral loads. It is transferred partly by the variation of shear stress in the critical section 
and the rest by flexure. The fraction transferred by the variation of shear stress about an axis is denoted as m u v. Just to summarize that the second and third terms are related with the moment that gets transferred from the slab to the column. This moment can generate due to an unbalanced loads on the two sides of the spans. So, if the spans are of different length, then we can have a moment generated even if the load is uniformly placed. And if the spans are of same length, then also we can have a moment if the live load is placed only on one side. Thus, first we need to calculate the moment that gets transferred from the slab to the column. If there is lateral load acting, then this moment is available from the analysis of the equivalent frame. Now, from that moment, part of it is resisted by the variation of shear stress in the critical section. And that fraction we are denoting as m u v. Thus, m u v about 2 2 is the fraction of moment transferred about axis 2 2. m u v 1 1 is the fraction of moment transferred about axis 1 1. The shear and moments acting at the critical section are shown below. If you see the first diagram, the shear force V u acts at the center of the column. In the second diagram, M u v is the part of the moment that acts about the axis 2 2. And in the third diagram, you see M u v 1 1 is the part of the moment that acts about axis 1 1. Thus, these are the three forces that are acting in the critical section which generates shear. The shear stresses due to these individual forces are represented below. Vu generates a uniform shear stress all around the critical section. Muv about 2 2 generates a varying shear stress which varies from the left to right as we cross the axis 2 2. It is of course, uniform in the faces which are parallel to the axis 2 2. Similarly, the shear stress that is generated by M u v 1 1 varies in the faces that is perpendicular to 1 1 and they are uniform about the faces that are perpendicular uh, that are parallel to 1 1. Thus, once we understand this the mechanism of the transfer of shear from the slab to the column, we can develop the expression of the shear stress that was given before. That means, the first term of the shear stress is V u divided by the area in the perimeter which is B 0 d. The second term is due to the moment acting about the axis 2 2 and the third term is the moment that is acting about the axis 1 1. And we add them up for the maximum shear stress that occurs anywhere in the critical section. If you note in this sketch that the right hand corner near the the near corner in that case say if I pick up this corner then the shear stress is downwards for due to V u. Similarly, due to M u V 2 2 that is also downwards and the maximum value and for the shear due to M u V 1 1 that is also downwards and the maximum value. Thus, it is in this corner that all the shear stresses are additive and hence we are adding all the terms to get the maximum shear stress that generates in the critical section. The resultant shear stress diagram is shown below. Here you can see that the stresses have added up in this 
closer right hand corner and it is less in the other corners, but it is the closer right hand corner which determines the shear demand and hence in all the terms of the shear demand we are adding the values due to the three terms. The fraction of moment transferred by the variation of shear stress about an axis which is denoted as m u v is given in terms of the total moment transferred m u as follows. As I said earlier that first we need to calculate m u for gravity loads it is calculated from the unbalanced loads on the two spans on the two sides for lateral loads m u is calculated from the analysis of the equivalent frame. Now, once we know mu, then we can calculate muv by this expression. muv is equal to 1 minus alpha times mu. The value of mu due to unbalanced gravity load is calculated by placing live load on one side of the column only. The value of mu due to lateral loads is available from the analysis of the equivalent frame and then we can combine the effects of the gravity loads and live loads based on the load combinations that we are familiar with. The parameter alpha is based on the aspect ratio of the critical section. It has been found that when the critical section is square then the resistance to shear is better for this punching shear and hence this parameter has been developed to quantify the shear capacity for non square sections. That means, for non square sections it will be less than the value corresponding to a square critical section. The parameter alpha depends on the aspect ratio of the critical section. The aspect ratio means the ratio of one side divided by the other side of the critical section. Alpha is equal to 1 divided by 1 plus 2 thirds of square root of B 1 divided by B 2. As here B 1 and B 2 are the dimensions of the critical section parallel to axis 1 1 and 2 2 and then from the aspect ratio we can calculate the value of the parameter alpha. Next once we know m u v the next quantity we need to know is the polar moment of inertia. The polar moments of inertia of the critical section about the axis are given as follows j about 1 1 is equal to 2 times 1 by 12 b 2 d cube plus 1 by 12 d b 2 cube plus b 1 d times b 2 divided by 2 whole square. Similarly, j about 2 2 is equal to 2 times 1 divided by 12 b 1 d cube plus 1 divided by 12 d b 1 cube plus b 2 d times b 1 divided by 2 whole square. The expressions of this polar moments of inertia has been determined based on the parallel axis and perpendicular axis theorems. These theorems are covered in the undergraduate structural analysis courses and from that theorems we can develop these expressions of the polar moments of inertia. For adequate shear capacity the tau v which is the resultant shear stress demand due to the three forces should be less than or equal to k s tau c. The shear stress capacity of concrete for a square column is given as follows. Tau v is less than or equal to 0 0.25 root over f c k where f c k is the characteristic strength of the concrete in the slab. 
the effect of pre-stress is neglected. Thus, the shear capacity tau c is given as 0 0.25 root over f c k by neglecting the effect of pre-stress. The factor k s accounts for the reduced shear capacity of non-square columns. Again, as I said that for a cross section which is not square, it has been found that the shear capacity is lower than that of a square cross section and that is taken account by this factor k s, where k s is equal to 0 0.5 plus beta c. The value of k s should be less than 1 and beta c is a parameter based on the aspect ratio of the column cross section. It is the ratio of the short side to long side of the column or column capital. Again, beta c is the ratio of the short side to the long side of the column. To that, we are adding 0.5 to get this value of k s. We need to make sure that k s is less than or equal to 1 and then we are multiplying k s to tau c which is, is equal to 0 0.25 root over f c k and by that we are getting the shear capacity of the critical section at a point. For adequate shear capacity, the shear demand tau v has to be less than or equal to tau c. If tau v exceeds k s tau c, a drop panel or shear reinforcement needs to be provided at the slab to column junction. Thus, if we find that the shear demand tau v is greater than the capacity k s tau c, then we have two options in hand. The first option is we can thicken the slab around the columns and that is called a drop panel. The second option is which is applied for flat plates that to provide shear reinforcement inside the slab. The shear reinforcement can be in the form of stirrups or eye section which is sometimes called shear head or based on shear studs. The reinforcement based on shear studs reduces congestion for conduits and post tensioning tendons. There has been various types of shear reinforcement some of which we shall cover in this lecture and depending on the suitability that means how much reinforcement we have in the column depending on that we can select what type of shear reinforcement we need to provide at the slab to column junction. If tau v exceeds 1.5 tau c it is a an upper limit in that case the depth of the slab needs to be increased in the form of drop panels. That means the code says that if the shear demand is very high which is like 1.5 times tau c then we need to increase the depth of the slab around the columns which is known as drop panels. The stirrups are designed based on the following equation. A s v is equal to tau v minus 0 0.5 tau c divided by 0 0.87 f y. Thus, we have calculated the shear demand tau v. From that, we are subtracting only half of the shear capacity of the concrete which is 0.5 tau c and we are dividing that by the permissible stress in the stirrups which is 0.87 f y to get the value of A s v which is the shear reinforcement around the critical section. The stirrups are provided along the perimeter of the critical section. The first row of stirrups should be within a distance of 0 0.5 d from the face of the column. They can be continued in outer rows which are concentric and geometrically similar to the critical section at an interval of 0 0.75 d till the section 
with the shear stress tau v is equal to 0 0.5 tau c. Let us understand this by the help of a sketch. The different types of reinforcement at the slab to column junction are shown in the following sketches. This sketches has been taken from Bureau of Indian Standards publication handbook on concrete reinforcement and detailing which is SP 34 1987 and the second reference is by Kahn and Williams and the title of the book is Post Tension Concrete Floors and it has been published by Butterworth and Heinemann Limited. In this figure we see that around the column section we have identified the critical section and we are providing the stirrups in a perimeter which is geometrically similar and concentric to the column cross section. The first row of stirrups should start within a distance 0.5 d, so that at least there is one row of stirrups that intercepts the punching shear and then we may provide subsequent rows of stirrups till the shear demand comes below 0.5 tau c. And in this figure we have seen that we are providing the stirrups in two more rows and you can see that these stirrups are also placed in a perimeter which is geometrically similar and concentric to the column cross section. We have to provide some holder bars for the stirrups in case of pre-stress slabs and these stirrups have to be placed in an perimeter which is geometrically similar to the column cross section. The second type of shear reinforcement is by the beam cage reinforcement. In this figure we are showing some stirrups which are analogous to beam stirrups. These are closed stirrups placed about the holder bars and if I take a cross section at the mid depth of the slab, then the vertical legs of the stirrups appear this way. Again we see that the stirrups are around the column which is geometrically similar and concentric to the column cross section. This is another alternative of placing the stirrups around the columns. The third alternative is by providing bent up bars. This is suitable in absence of lateral loads and if the amount of shear reinforcement is less, we can provide some bars which has inclined legs and these inclined legs can carry the vertical component of the shear force and hence again if I take a section at the mid depth of the slab, then we see that the legs of the stirrup appear to be in a about a perimeter which is geometrically similar and concentric to the column cross section. The fourth type of the shear reinforcement in a flat plate especially can be given by shear head or which are I sections welded together. In this sketch we find that there are two I sections which have been welded at the center and this shear head reinforcement can be placed at the slab to column junction to sufficiently increase the shear capacity of the junction. Finally, we are coming to the reinforcement based on shear studs. Here shear studs are welded to plates and this assembly is placed at the slab to column junction. The advantage of a shear stud reinforcement is that it does not intercept the main reinforcement through the column and 
the placement of the pre-stressing tendons conduits is easier if we have this shear stud reinforcement. Thus, depending on the column reinforcement, the layout of the pre-stressing tendons, the any other obstruction, whether it is an electrical conduit, in that depending on this, we are selecting the type of shear reinforcement to enhance the shear capacity of the slab to column junction. The residual moment transferred by flexure, which is denoted as MUF, is given in terms of the total moment transferred MU as follows. MUF is equal to alpha times MU. Thus, what we have seen is that the moment to be transferred is MU, part is transferred by shear, which is 1 minus alpha times MU, and that we have denoted as MUV, and the, the other part, which is transferred due to flexure, is denoted as MUF, and MUF is equal to alpha times MU, and this MUF will be resisted by additional flexural reinforcement. Additional non pre stressed reinforcement is provided at the top of the slab over a width C2 plus 3H centered with respect to the column to transfer MUF. Thus, once we know MUF, we can calculate what is the amount of non pre stressed reinforcement that is required to transfer this MUF in each orthogonal direction and reinforcement is provided and it is distributed over a width C2 plus 3 times the depth of the slab and in that width this additional reinforcement is banded to transfer the part of the moment by flexure. Next we are coming to the design of spandrel beams. The flat plates are provided with spandrel beams at the edges. These beams stiffen the edges against rotation. In turn, the beams are subjected to torsion. When we had earlier studied about flat plates, we said that the flat plate option is selected to have a flat bottom beneath the slab so that it does not create any obstruction for the conduits. Even for pla plates, usually a beam is provided around the edge of the building, which does not intercept the conduits and this beam stiffens the edges of the slab against rotation and these special beams are termed as spandrel beams. In turn, the spandrel beams are subjected to torsion for which they have to be analyzed and designed if required. The maximum torsion is calculated by assuming a uniform torsional loading along the width of the equivalent frame. Of course, SEI 31802 recommends a triangular distribution. The spandrel beams are provided with closed stirrups to resist the torsion. The design for torsion is given in the module of analysis and design for shear and torsion. In this figure, we are showing that what is the torsion variation along the spandrel beam. We have selected the width of the equivalent frame and we are assuming that the torsional load is uniformly distributed along this length of the spandrel beam which spans in the transverse direction along L2. If the torsional loading is uniform, then the maximum torsion will be at the face of the column and we are denoting this maximum torsion as T u max. The maximum torsion T u max is given as follows. T u max equal to L 2 
which is the width of the equivalent frame minus C2 which is the width of the column parallel to L2 divided by 2 that means we are dividing that area into two parts times M E minus divided by L2. This is the moment negative moment at the exterior support which is uniformly distributed about L2 and thus the maximum torque depends on the moment per unit length which is denoted as M E minus divided by L2 times the half of the tributary length which is L2 minus C2 divided by 2. Once we calculate T u max, then we need to make sure that the shear capacity T u r is greater than or equal to T u max. And the torsion design was covered in a previous module on analysis and design for shear and torsion. We need to make sure that the stirrups are closed in a spandrel beam because torsion generates a circulatory shear around the periphery of the beam. Next, we are moving on to the anchorage devices of the flat slabs and flat plates. In post tension slab, the anchorage devices transfer the pre stress to the concrete. The device at the stretching end consists of an anchor block and wedges. At the dead end, the wires are looped to provide the anchorage. Bursting links are provided in the end zone to resist transverse tensile stresses in concrete. Earlier when we had studied anchorage devices for beams, we had seen that in post tensioned members, the anchorage device is of extreme importance. Because the pre stress is transferred to the concrete at the ends. The similar is true for post tension slabs. In the stretching end, we have an anchorage block with wedges against which the tendon rests on the concrete, and in the dead end, the tendons can be opened up to form a loop, and this loop itself is sufficient to transfer the pre stress from the tendon to the concrete. We also provide bursting links near this anchorage zone, so as to check cracking due to the transverse tensile stresses that is generate, then generated due to the stress concentration. In this figure, we can see the anchorage device at the stretching end that the tendons after they are passed through the duct, then they pass through a casting which is a funnel shape and then we have the anchorage block within which there are wedges and against these wedges the strands are hold. There is also the provision for grout tube by which we can pass on the grout after the post tensioning operation has been done. The recess former is used so that after the post tensioning operation is done, then we can put some concrete around this anchorage block and cover it up so that it cannot be seen from outside. Thus, this, this recess former is just for an aesthetic purpose, it is not for a functional use. The anchorage device for dead end appears like this that after the duct ends, then the strands are opened up to form a loop and in this loop a bar is passed and this loop rests again the, against the concrete which helps to transfer the pre stress which is lower in the dead end and this special form can avoid any wedge action that is necessary if we have to provide any block at the dead end. We, there can be also a grout tube to pass grout from the dead end. 
This is another sketch of the anchorage device for the dead end that we can have a plate against which the strands are hold and this plate rests against the concrete surface. This is a figure of the end of the post tension slab and at the stretching zone you can see that this is the funnel the casting piece and then we have the anchorage block inside. We can also observe the bursting links which checks the transverse tensile stresses and note that in the spandrel beam there are closed stirrups which help to carry torsion and this spandrel beam is required for the flat plates in order to stiffen the edge of the slab against rotation. This is the figure for the dead end and here you observe that after the duct the strands have been exposed, they have been spread out and they have been opened up to form a bulb or a loop and this loop resists against the concrete and which provides the anchorage at the dead end. There we have also provided bursting links near the duct and you note that in the spandrel beam the stirrups are closed stirrups. Next we are moving on to some additional aspects of analysis and design of two way slabs. First, we are trying to understand that what is the effect of pre-stress on the other components of the building. The slab rests on the columns. Now due to the restraint from monolithic columns or walls, the pre-stressing force in the slab is reduced. That means when if the column and the slab are cast together and then after that when we are post tensioning the slab, the pre, -stress, the pre stressing operation is facing a restraint from the columns or the walls which have been integrally cast with the slab. Hence, the stiff columns or walls should be located in such a manner that they offer least restraint. Alternatively, sliding joints can be introduced which are made ineffective after post tensioning of the slab. Since the stiff columns and walls provide some restraint in the pre-stressing operation, we need to locate them in such a way so that it creates the least resistance. There is another alternative option that we can have a sliding joint between the slab and the column which will be removed after the post tensioning operation has been done and in that way we can reduce the restraint from the vertical elements on the pre stressing force. The second is the calculation of deflection. The deflection of a two way slab can be approximately calculated by the equivalent frame method. We have studied that the equivalent frame method is one option to analyze and design a two way slab. This method itself can be used to calculate the deflections. The deflection at a point is the summation of the deflections of the two orthogonal strips passing through the point. Thus, if we take the middle of a slab, there are two strips passing through a point and the deflections of these two strips are approximately added up to get the total deflection at that point. Now this is an easy way to find out the deflection from the analysis of the equivalent frame method. There are of course more refined analysis to find the deflections. For an accurate evaluation the following models can be adopted. A grillage model or a finite element model. These models are 
based on the finite element concept and where the slab is divided into small plate elements or beam elements in a grillage model and these models can be used to find out the deflection more accurately. Third is proportioning of drop panels and column capitals. Section 31 of IS 456-2000 provide guidelines for the proportioning of drop panels and column capitals. A minimum length and a minimum depth beyond the depth of the slab of a drop panel are specified. That means, even if we provide drop panels or column capitals, we need to have them adequate enough to function properly. The code IS456 gives some guidelines on proportioning the drop panels and column capitals. For drop panels, they have to be of a minimum length and a minimum depth beyond the slab and for column capitals, they have to be of a proper shape, so that the concrete in the column capital is effective. For column capitals, it is preferred to have a conical flaring at a subtended angle of 90 degree. That means, whenever we are providing a column capital, it is preferred that the subtended angle be in the column capital should be 90 degree. If there is material outside this 90 degree, then that has to be neglected in the analysis of the, of the slabs. Thus, once we proportion the drop panel and column capital properly, then only we can take their full advantage. The critical sections are shown in figure 12 of the reference. Thus, IS 456 gives us guidelines that what are the critical sections if we have a drop panel or if we have a column capital. Those details are not being mentioned here, but you can refer to IS 456 to go through these details. Thus, in this lecture, we, are cov we have covered the two-way slabs. After refreshing the flexural design, we moved on to the analysis and design for shear. We have found that for two-way slabs, there are two types of shear which needs to be checked. The first is the one-way shear which is similar to the beam under flexure and that is checked for each orthogonal direction separately. The second type of shear is the punching shear, which is checked for both the directions simultaneously. The punching shear is checked for a critical section, which is geometrically similar and concentric to the column cross section. If the shear capacity is not adequate, then we provide shear reinforcement and the type is selected based on how much column reinforcement we have and how much shear reinforcement we need. We also studied the anchorage devices for the post tension slabs and finally, we moved on to the additional aspects like the restraint due to vertical elements and the deflection. With this, we are ending the module on two-way slabs. Thank you.